Hello, my name is Paul Gallagher and I'm going to act as your moderator for this webinar today. I'm a general surgeon based in Northumbria with an interest in upper gastrointestinal surgery. That's the area that involves the treatment of conditions affecting the esophagus, stomach and biliary tract. I'm also the head of school of surgery for the northeast of Cumbria with responsibility for the management of all our surgical training programs in the region. We'd like to thank the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh for the opportunity to present this webinar today. This is one of a series of webinars provided by the Regional Surgical Advisors of the College, or RSAs. There are over 40 RSAs who are consultants and college fellows who provide advice and support at a local level across the United Kingdom. You may well have met one of us at your local educational event or careers evening at your medical school. Please find more details about us on the RCS Ed website. Um, tonight's, today's speaker is Cynthia Borg. Cynthia is a consultant surgeon at the University Hospital Lewisham. She specializes in bariatric and metabolic surgery and benign upper gastrointestinal surgery. She has been an RSA for several years and is also a council member of our national associations for upper gastrointestinal surgery and bariatric surgery. The topic of today is, is dysphagia due to dysmotility or tumour? What do I do next? We'll be using a poll at the start to warm you up with some questions. Then during the talk, you can use the Zoom question and answer facility to pose questions to the speaker. Please see the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will save uh, the questions until the end of the presentation and try to answer the most popular questions. Please vote with a thumbs up symbol beside the questions you would most like answered. I'll now hand over to Cynthia. Thank you very much um, Paul, thank you for the introduction and thank you all for joining us today. Hope you are all safe and well. On your behalf, I also would like to thank the college, especially um, Mike Silva for coordinating all this, as well as Ryan and Heather, who are um, also from the college and are working behind the scenes. So, the topic for today, as Paul said, is um, dysphagia. And we're going to be talking about the causes of dysphagia, its evaluation and the management. So I'd like to um, introduce two cases in, in order to be able to delineate this, um, these investigations and the management that we're going to do. The first patient is Mr. AB. He's 67 years of age and he comes to endoscopy um, with a history of progressive difficulty in swallowing that started three months back. He recalls it very vividly and first says that he choked on a piece of steak about three months ago. Since then, this has been going, getting progressively worse and he can only um, drink soup now. He is a lifelong smoker, having smoked from the age of 16. His wife is with him. She's very concerned. She's concerned because she has to cook twice. She has to cook her own dinners and she has to do soups for him. She's also very concerned because she can see that her husband is losing weight. He's lost seven kilos over the last two months. And she also very recently noticed a lump in his neck and she points to the supraclavicular region. The next patient is Miss X. She's 35, she's recently married. You see her in your outpatient's clinic complaining of reflux. When you're asking the questions, she also um, uh, has a long history of difficulty with drinking, both, um, with drinking liquids and also with eating solids. Her husband, who's not with her for the, for the um, clinic, says that um, she's waking him up at night very frequently with coughing. Now, how are we going to investigate these two people? We're going to take a history, we're going to listen, and we're also going to ask some questions. The first thing we're going to ask is about dysphagia. Now, what dysphagia is, is a, di is a difficulty or inability to swallow. We're going to ask the patient whether 
it's progressive or whether it's intermittent. And what are they unable to eat or drink? This is also going to be very important for our management. Because if we're seeing a patient like Mr. AB who's telling us that he's barely able to drink, then we, we need to do something while we're doing our urgent investigations to make sure that he's well fed and well hydrated. We will ask about odynophagia. Now, odynophagia is pain on swallowing. And when patients have odynophagia, usually they have either an inflammatory or an infective process going on. Lots of patients come and tell us about reflux. However, reflux is a very vague, a very vague symptom, and we really need to ask them what they mean. Some patients turn up in any with crushing chest pain, having an MI and saying that they have reflux. So we really, really need to take an appropriate history of the pain. What do they mean? Regurgitation. Regurgitation is effortless um, fluid or food coming back up. Now, regurgitation usually happens when either the patients bend or when they lie down in bed. So we also, an important question is, how many pillows are they using? Are they propping up the um, head of the bed? The other thing we need to ask is about chest symptoms, about chest pain, because that might be an indication of a sugeal spasm, and also about cough and recurrent chest infections, because those might be a sign of silent aspiration. Then we proceed with the examination. We really need to check their weight. We, we check for signs of malnutrition. We look for metastatic spread, as well as signs of systemic disease like systemic sclerosis. Now, when we're taking a history, when we're examining the patients, we must have a differential diagnosis in mind, yeah? So, in terms of, um, of causes of dysphagia, we have causes that may be in the lumen, intraluminal, and here we've got a, a low power cross-section of the esophagus. So intraluminal problems can be things like foreign bodies or a food bolus. But remember, a food bolus may be a sign of some intramural narrowing. So, it is not normal for a 67 year old to say, oh, I'm choking in my food. Yeah, that's not normal. That probably is an indication of an obstructing lesion, either in the wall or extraluminally. So neural causes can involve the epithelium, this lining here, which in the esophagus is usually a squamous epithelium. Most commonly we get, we get um, complications of reflux, things like um, severe inflammation or peptic strictures that might give our patients intermittent um, dysphagia, or else malignancies like squamous or adenocarcinoma that we will deal with and talk about in a bit more detail later. We also have the submucosa here, where we can get the motility disorders involving the um, muscles or submucosal tumors. Then we have extra luminal causes, things like compression from lymph nodes, from tumors, from vascular structures, as well as um, things like hernias. Remember, there can be a proportion of our patients that have psychological um, issues and that you investigate them and you don't find any, any um, physical cause of their, um, their dysphagia. But obviously, that is a diagnosis of exclusion. So today, we're going to be emphasizing mainly on these malignant lesions, as well as the motility disorders. Ocephageal cancer usually presents in the sixth to seventh decade. It is um, mo more common in males. Usually, there's a three to one um, ratio. It often presents late and hence may be associated with a poor prognosis. And Cancer Research UK actually quotes the five-year survival as about 15%.
We've got squamous cell carcinoma. That's the commoner one of the two worldwide, especially in the developed world. Usually it's in the upper two thirds, most commonly in the middle third. And there are risk factors like alcohol, smoking, dietary factors, like things like lack of vitamin C and carcinogens like the nitrosamides. The commoner tumor in the UK and certainly in the Western world is the adenocarcinoma. It's usually found in the lower third of the esophagus and the risk factor certainly is um, reflux, Barrett's esophagus, obesity and also smoking. Now with regards to primary esophageal motility disorders, here we can see a normal swallow. So up here, We've got the um, upper oesophageal sphincter, high pressure zone, about 100 millimeters of mercury. Then we give the patient something to drink. This is a manometry. So we give the patient something to drink. And here you can see the bowl is move, usually with a speed of about five, um, five centimeters per second until it reaches another high pressure zone here, which is the lower surgical sphincter, which relaxes, allowing the bolus to go into the stomach. With regards to um, these motility, disor motility disorders, we've got the classical echelasia. So with classical echelasia, what we have is a failure of the lower subgeal sphincter there to relax. So what happens is that the body of the esophagus try tries to pump hard and harder, it hypertrophies, but then in the end, it gives up and can be atonic. Then we have got some other conditions which, are, um, which involve hypercontraction of the esophagus with big, big waves um, and the patients might get things like chest pain. We also can get um, uncoordinated contraction of the body with diffuse esophageal spasm or a hypocontraction of the body. And that hypocontraction is very commonly seen with reflux oesophagitis. It's like a neg and chicken situation. What came first, the reflux or the hypocontraction? Echelasia is the one that is most commonly studied and the, the one that, that, is, you know, that we're going to talk about today as well. There are other disorders that secondarily may cause a muscle problems. Um, Chagas disease, it's, a, um, it's a, an infection, a protozoan infection that's um, common in South America. There are other diseases that affect muscles like scleroderma that can give rise to um, motility disorders. And there's also what's known as pseudoachalasia, which is a tumor of the, um, of the cardia that can mimic um, can mimic achalasia both in terms of symptoms but also more worryingly when we do manometry. So in terms of investigation for dysphagia our um, gold standard investigation is going to be an upper GI endoscopy. In this um, test which we can do either with local anesthetic, with throat spray, or with um, a, an intravenous sedative, with conscious sedation. We will be able to assess the lining of the esophagus, but also we'll be able to do biopsies. So in terms of NICE, NICE says that we should offer urgent direct excess endoscopy within two weeks, what we call a two-week wait endoscopy in patients with dysphagia, any age, or if they are aged 55 or over with weight loss and any of the following, either upper abdominal pain or reflux symptoms or else dyspepsia. Again, we have some other investigations that we might use, um, contrast studies, cross-sectional imaging, we've already discussed the manometry, and also some other investigations, specialist investigations, that we might um, need in terms of um, tumor staging. So this is Mr. AB, he came for his endoscopy. Here we can see a raised area very close 
to the gastroesophageal junction, which is here, and at the proximal end of this raised area, we can see an ulcerated area here. We biopsy, we take multiple biopsies, and the histology was an adenocarcinoma. While we're waiting for the biopsies to be processed, we send Mr. AB for a CT scan of his neck, chest, and abdo. And what we can see here is the oesophagus, which is dilated, which has got a neck centric lesion there, um, here on the coronals, and there we can see it on the sagittals. Again, one must notice where the oesophagus is lying in terms of the other structures in the chest. And that determines the spread, the easy spread of the of oesophageal cancer to the rest of the um, chest organs, and also the difficulties that we might experience in actually removing surgically a tumor of the oesophagus. Now, this is the TNM classification. You don't really need to know it, but if the tumor is um, very, very um, superficial, there might be some options rather than other than surgery that we can offer to the patients. So this is Mrs. Miss X's um, endoscopy. So we can see that it's completely different now. The mucosa looks perfectly normal and healthy. We can see the GOJ there. And when we retroflex, when we're in the stomach and look back on ourselves in the cardia, as we're doing here, there are no lesions, no tumors, and that excludes that pseudoachalasia that we were talking about. So what are we going to do? We're a bit stuck with Miss, Miss X, what's going on? So we sent her off for a barium study. So here we can see the oesophagus is dilated. So the oesophagus usually is quite small in diameter, certainly not as much as, as wide as a vertebra, which you can see here. You can also see flocculations and residual food there. What we can also see here is an air fluid level in the oesophagus that we shouldn't see. And we, sh we can also see the tapering of the lower oesophagus in, in like a, it's called a bird beak appearance. And here we can see the fluid going slowly, slowly through the um, GOJ. Again, another feature that is missing on this Supper GI study and is quite typ typical in cases of echelasia uh, is the absence of a gastric bubble. So these features, the, um, the fluid level, the bird beak appearance and the lack of um, gastric bubble are quite typical of echelasia. In order to prove that it's echelasia, we also send her off for a manometry. And here we can see failure of relaxation of the LOS, as well as a absence of peristaltic waves when she's given boluses to drink. So when we are managing patients with dysphagia, we need to, um, first of all, take care of their nutrition to try and prevent aspiration and because that's going to obviously harm their chest, giving, give them um, chest infections, especially if we're thinking of operating on them, and then come to definitive management. In terms of echelasia, um, we can try Botox. Usually it, it's, it only gives a temporary relief of the symptoms. So what we're trying to do in, to, in, in order to manage the achalasia is to try and relax that lower oesophageal sphincter. So we can try Botox, especially in patients who are elderly and who would not um, withstand anything else. We can try endoscopic dilatation with an achalasia balloon. Usually it's very high pressure for about three minutes. Or else we can um, do a Heller's cardiomyotomy. These days we do it laparoscopically and um, we dissect the hiatus. We do a long myotomy on the anterior surface of the esophagus and take it a couple of centimeters onto the stomach. Also of note, um, achalasia does confer a small risk of oesophageal cancer long term. So some 
patients opt to have, say, annual or um, one, once every couple of years have an endoscopy just to check that they, that they decrease the risk. In terms of esophageal cancer, um, when we're going to manage patients, we need to assess their fitness. Are they fit for a, a rather um, big operation? We also need to stage the disease. We've, also, or we've already talked about the use of CT scanning. We can also sometimes um, require PET, endoscopic ultrasound, fine needle aspiration, and staging laparoscopy. So in our gentleman, in Mr. AB, you remember that his wife had pointed out the supraclavicular lymph node. He had an FNA of that, and that showed malignant adenocarcinoma there. So um, when he was discussed in the MDT, the question that we always ask is, can the patient be treated with curative intent? And certainly, because this is a metastasis, a dis and classified as, as a distance metastasis, Mr. AB could not be dealt with with a curative intent, but needed palliative treatment. If he was, um, if he was to have, um, if, if he didn't have that metastasis and if the tumor was um, deemed curative, usually in tumors that are squamous, um, squamous cancer, especially in the upper third of, of the esophagus, um, most um, MDTs would recommend chemoradiotherapy. Sometimes the, um, either the MDT or the, the um, surgeon would, and the patient would opt for surgery. With adenocarcinomas, if they are very, very superficial, if they're T1A, one may, one may offer endoscopic excision, but remember with endoscopic excision, you're not going to take those lymph nodes, although the chances of having lymph node mets in T1A is small, or else we can offer neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery. With palliative um, treatment, we, um, we try to control the symptoms and improve the patient's quality of life. And we can do that with stents, with laser, with palliative radiotherapy. In terms of surgery for esophageal cancer, We've already said that the esophagus lies in the back of the chest in quite a, you know, a tricky position surrounded by the heart in the front. The, you know, it's all, you know, we've got the ribs, we've got the, um, the vertebra, we've got muscles, nerves, big vessels um, going across. So it all depends about it, where the tumor is located and the surgeon's and the patient's preference. Certainly, we can't sort of stretch the rest of the esophagus down, so we need to use a conduit, usually the stomach, to go up to the chest. Sometimes we, the surgeon and the patient preferences are that they do offer open surgery, and sometimes um, if, if the skills, the facilities are there, then one can opt for laparoscopic or even robotic surgery. So in conclusion, there are several causes of dysphagia, but when you see a patient with dysphagia, you have to exclude a malignancy with a two-week weight endoscopy. Always think nutrition, how is the patient going to survive um, and to, to be well hydrated while I'm doing the, these tests. And remember, you're not alone. This is going to be in, in terms of tumor management and even echelasia management, this is going to be in the setting of an MDT, a multidisciplinary team. Thank you very much. Any questions? Cynthia, thank you very much for that thorough overview where we, we've covered many things with the for two very interesting case histories. Um, the audience have come with lots of questions. Um, and first of all, we'd just like to start with some questions about clinical assessment. So first of all, how would you differentiate reflux from regurgitation from the history, and maybe to describe what's the difference between reflux and regurgitation. Okay, so what most patients would mean by reflux is heartburn. So they eat something, and after a couple of minutes, then they start getting discomfort. It may sort of radiate up to their chest, and it may be accompanied by regurgitation. Usually with reflux, patients can take um, 
over-the-counter drugs, things like um, antacids or sometimes even milk, and that gets better and that can differentiate it from other causes of abdominal pain. Um, regurgitation is sort of effortless, um, effortless uh, uh, food or liquid coming up usually to the mouth. Some patients also com uh, complain of, of water brush, sort of the acid irritating the back of the mouth and sort of an acid, um, an acid taste in the mouth. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, another clinical question, um, and first of all, a uh, terminology question. What's the difference between dyspepsia and reflux? Okay, so this dyspepsia is, is a, sort of a up any abdominal pain that's associated with with eating so you know it, it, it's 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 a sort of any any pain that occurs after eating or that's associated with eating is dyspepsia. So sometimes even on GP referrals, you can see patients with dyspepsia and the patients end up having biliary colic. So it's, you know, you need to, to ask more probing questions in terms of the, what is triggering it? Is it being triggered with fatty foods? Is it being triggered with, with things like um, spicy foods and then do the appropriate investigations. So we need a, a thorough interrogation of the patient's history, really, to see what they mean by the term dyspepsia, because they might just have a vague sense of something not being right. Exactly, um, exactly. With esophagitis, when they get dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, what is the mechanism for that? I think that's due to actual inflammation of the esophagus and ulceration. Sometimes you go in, have a look at endoscopically and say, my goodness, the patient has, what are these ulcers from? And you sort of biopsy, take lots and lots of biopsies and they're all benign or reactive. You give them PPIs for four, for four weeks. You go back down and check again and all that is gone. So certainly sometimes with the edema, with the inflammation, that may trigger also a feeling of, you know, of, of food getting stuck. Well, we're going to move on to some slightly more technical questions now about investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, what is the significance of endoscopic ultrasound in diagnosis of esophageal cancer from Malif? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Malif. Okay. So, once you have a diagnosis with biopsies of osophageal cancer, then endoscopic ultrasound is very good to see the spread. How much has it invaded into the osophageal wall? How much has it invaded? Has it gone beyond, has it gone beyond the submucosa? Has it gone into the muscles? Has it gone into the things like the pleura, the pericardial cavity? What is also good with endoscopic ultrasound is that you can see the lymph nodes. Now, some lymph nodes on CT yeah, can be equivocal. As we're saying, it's usually associated with ulceration. With ulceration, you, make, you can get reactive changes in the lymph nodes. So with the, um, with the EUS, it's very good because you can actually get fine needle aspiration of those lymph nodes. Also, CT is, is um, notoriously bad to see how much, um, how much the tumor has spread into the muscle. So EUS endoscopic ultrasound is very, very good for that. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, and now a question about treatment. At, at what stage do we decide, decide to go with palliative treatment for esophageal cancer rather than an attempt at curative treatment? Okay, so certainly, First of all, the patient fitness. This is very, very important. You don't want to do a lovely operation, but then the patient dies. And so you need to check the patient, uh, to assess the patient's fitness and check what the patient expects. You know, are there underlying conditions? Regarding, um, regarding um, the TNM classification, T, T4 means that the, that the, um, the tumour has actually spread to, co to the um, surrounding structures. So unless you're able to remove the, the 
tumor and block with the lymph nodes, then there's no real point to subject your, the patient to such an extensive operation if you're not getting an arnold resection. Now, sometimes, despite all the, um, all the staging, all our best intentions, we, we go in, we do a resection, and anyway, find that it has spread beyond our margins, usually our circumferential margins. Thanks, Cynthia. We've got a couple of minutes left, so I'm just going to move um, on to the patient with reflux. Um, and there were some questions about the, the management um, of patients there. And what, what is the way or the mechanism that the esophageal physiology tests are done, just on a, a practical basis for what the patient has to go through, first of all? Okay, so... Um, usually, at least in our case, we, we would send the patient to, to a center because it, it's very important that, that these, these tests that are so um, highly specialized are done in a center that sees lots of these because even the reporting, it's not just, you know, you just look at the, you know, you get lots of results. So what, what we do first, what they do first is pass a little tube, like a en little NG tube, down the the back of the nose and the oesophagus into the stomach. And then there, they, the, the tube has um, little side holes little, that they can um, perfuse fluid through. And what happens is that they ask the patient to, to um, swallow and then ask the patient to drink. And they usually do five dry swallows, five um, wet swallows, and then check um, the motility and uh, like that trace that we had, the pressures and hence the pressures. Once they find the, um, where the gastroesophageal junction is, where, where the um, lower esophageal sphincter is, then they would be able to put a, the, pH, uh, uh, the pH probe. And the pH probe usually is for 24 hours. There are some instances when, where we can also do manometry for 24 hours in patients with things like diffusional sphageal spasms or where the symptoms are intermittent so that we try and catch the symptoms. The, um, the pH um, study also, they have a little box which they can press so that when they have the symptoms, like when a patient is experiencing what they think is reflux, they press the button so that when they're reading the report, they can see whether that symptom correlates to what they are seeing on the actual trace. Thanks, Cynthia. And then the final question, after you've done an endoscopic dilatation, mm -hmm. do the patients suffer from reflux after you've got rid of their difficulty swallowing in, say, a patient with achalasia? So certainly, yes, that may be the case. Yeah, so you try and stretch it and weaken it. So with um, dilatations, usually the patients, um, that can happen. The other thing that can happen also is that you overdo it and you actually perforate the esophagus, perforate the mucosa as well. Some patients with dilatation need more than one dilatation. Then if you're going to do a heller, some some, actually most surgeons laparoscopically would do a um, small fundal placation. So you're, you're releasing the muscle, but then trying to prevent or circumvent that they have lots of reflux. So most patients, most people do a sort of door um, and anterior fundal placation, certainly. And um, that's, that's what I usually do in, in most of my patients. So they'd, they'd wrap the stomach over the esophagus to prevent reflux. Thank you, Cynthia. Now, we've got another 21 questions, but unfortunately no time to um, answer them. So your talk's generated an awful lot of interest. Uh, Cynthia, thank you so much for a really interesting overview and for answering the questions. Again, thank you to the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh for hosting this. Um, can I take this opportunity to mention that our next webinar is next Tuesday, the 28th of April at 4 p.m. Um, and the title is My Patient Has a Pulsatile Lump how do I approach this problem by Mr. Peng Wong? And as a reminder, along with all previous and future webinar, webinars, today's session will be recorded and available to watch on the college website. Again, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you to Cynthia and the Royal College. Thank you.